Good morning, good day, good afternoon, or whatever time you're watching this video. As you can see, I have my youngest daughter, Mariah, with me. She's going to be enjoying this chapter today with us to give mommy a break. Ain't that right, Mariah? Hmm? Can you give me a high five? High five for the people? Oh, not this morning. It's too early. You haven't had your coffee yet? <laughs> well, last time we left off at chapter uh, two, Strangers. This time we'll pick up at chapter three, The Peddler. <laughs> I ask that you all please like, share, and subscribe so that you'll be uh, with a notification bell on so that you'll be alerted each time I upload a new video and you can read along with me. Um, if you make it to the end, I think I'll include my cash app so that you can uh, help me out with purchasing uh, the rest of the collection in uh, this large print, uh, not hardback edition, so that uh, I can continue reading. And uh, there have been requests for other books already. If you have a request, please um, feel free to come in in the section below and comment on my pronunciation and anything you'd like to see on the channel or any critiques you might have. Uh, good or bad, I'd like to see you in the comments. Uh, let's build a community here. This is Tor, Carver Master of the Wave Dancer. And this is Chapter 3 of The Will of Time, Book 1, The Eye of the World, The Peddler. Let's just wait for this fellow to get out of the background over here. <laughs> oh, the sun's coming out, Mariah. The sun, here comes the sun. Da -da -da -da. Here comes the sun. Da -da -da -da. It's all right. <laughs> As you can see, I can't sing. Uh, there's actually another video on my channel where I do a little singing. Uh, a room full of ankles. It's about Matt and his exploits in taverns. Um, if you'll search for that video, <laughs> I'm sure you'll be amused. Um, I gotta warn you though, my singing voice is nothing like my speaking voice, so don't look for any Emmy. No Emmy. Well, Emmy's not music, is it? Don't look for any award-winning performance with my singing or with my ugly mug. Oh, it looks great. <laughs> Are you ready, Mariah? I think this fellow's leaving. I just don't want him to crank up that vehicle in the middle of the beginning of the chapter. So. Oh, there goes Amazon. Delivering some stuff. Um, Amazon is actually who is bringing this to the small screen. Um, the Will of Time on Prime. Follow them on Twitter. They are not associated with me. Uh, let me just put that disclaimer out there. I have nothing to do with Amazon. I don't work for Amazon. I just thought that it would be nice uh, to do a read-through. Uh, this is my umpteenth reread, and I'm doing a read-through now for you guys to share with you. Um, to build up uh, maybe another fan base, because this is going to be epic. I think it's going to be much, much larger uh, and much more, um, oh, look at our screen time, and much more of uh, an epic proportions than um, Game of Thrones, because Game of Thrones, the books were nowhere near as the Will of Time, good as the Will of Time books, and um, I'm a fan of Game of Thrones books, I like the TV show, didn't care for some of the changes that were made, but the first few, um, I, I'd say for the first season, they stuck fairly decently to the script. They didn't go off book too much, but then the series was never finished. So we don't know whether they stuck to what uh, good kinds, uh, not good kind, <laughs> no, like not that guy, to George R. R. Martin's um, thoughts on the book 
And look at that, I'm already at five minutes. But that fella has gone. And if you've made it through me rambling on, let's go ahead and uh, Mariah. Mariah. Shall we begin? Chapter three, The Peddler. Clusters of pots clattered and banged as the peddler's wagon rumbled over the heavy timbers of the wagon bridge, still surrounded by a cloud of villagers and farmers come for festival. The peddler reined his horse to a stop in front of the inn. From every direction, people streamed to swell the numbers around the great wagon, its wheels taller than any of the people, with their eyes fastened to the peddler above them on the wagon seat. The man on the wagon was Padden Fane, a pale, skinny fellow, with gangly arms and a massive beak of a nose. Fane, <laughs> always smiling and laughing as if he knew a joke that no one else knew, had driven his wagon and team into Emus Field every spring for as long as Rand could remember. The door of the inn flew open, even as the team halted in a jangle of harness and the village council appeared, led by Master Alvear and Tan. They marched out deliberately, even seeing Bew. Amid all the excited sh shouting of the others for pins or lace or books or a dozen other things, yeah. Reluctantly, the crowd parted to let them to the fore, everyone closing in quickly behind them, never stopping their calling to the peddler. Most of all, the villagers called for news. Are you going to be quiet so everybody can hear? Or are you going to start making noise? In the eyes of the villagers, needles and tea and the like were no more than half the freight in a peddler's wagon, every bit as important as word of outside, news of the world beyond the two rivers. Some peddlers simply told what they knew, throwing it out in a heap, a pile of rubbish with which they could not be bothered. Others had to have every word dragged out of them, speaking grudgingly with a bad grace. Mm -mm -mm. Mm -mm -mm. Fane, however, spoke freely if often teasingly and spun out the telling, making a show to rival a gleeman. He enjoyed being the center of attention, strutting around like an undersized rooster with every eye on him. It occurred to Rand that Fane might not be best pleased to find a real gleeman in Eamon's field. The peddler gave the counselor and villagers alike exactly the same attention as he fussed with trying his, tying his reins off just so, which was <clears throat> to say hardly any attention at all. He nodded casually to <coughs> no one in particular. <coughs> he smiled without speaking and waved absently to people who, <coughs> with whom he was particularly friendly, though his friendliness had always been of a peculiarly distant kind backslapping without ever getting close. The demands for him to speak grew louder, but Fane waited, fiddling with small tasks about the driver's seat for the crowd and the anticipation to reach the size he wanted. The council alone kept silent. They maintained the dignity befitting their position, but increasing clouds of pipe smoke rising above their heads showed the effort of it. Rand and Matt edged into the crowd, getting as close to the wagon as they could. Rand would have stopped halfway, but Matt wriggled through the press, pulling Rand behind him until they were right behind the council. I had been thinking you were going to stay out on the farm through the whole festival. Parents sh Ibarra shouted at Rand over the clamor. Half a head shorter than Rand, the curly-haired blacksmith apprentice was so stocky as to seem a man and a half wide, with arms and shoulders thick enough to rival those of Master Luhan himself. He could easily have pushed through the throne, but that was not his way in the Moriah. That was not his way. He picked his path carefully, offering apologies to people who had only half a mind to notice anything but the peddler. He made the apologies anyway and tried not to jostle anyone as he worked through the crowd. <laughs> he ran it back. Imagine it, he said, when he finally reached him. Bell tying and a peddler, both together. I'll bet they really are fireworks. You don't know a quarter of it, Matt laughed. 
Parent eyed him suspiciously, then looked a question at Ram. Then just ah, 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 ah. I'm gonna put your wet fingers on my boot. Come on, I don't think you can read with us. It's true, Rand shouted. Then gestured at the growing mass of people all giving notice. Later, I'll explain. Later, I said. At that moment, Pat and Fane stood up on the wagon seat, and the crowd quieted in an instant. Rand's last words exploded into utter silence, catching the peddler with an arm raised dramatically and his mouth open. Everybody turned to stare at Rand. The bony little man on the wagon, prepared to have everyone hanging on his first words, gave Rand a sharp, searching look. You social distancing? You wearing your mask? All right. Rand's face reddened and he wished he were you inside, so he did not stand out so clearly. His friends shifted uncomfortably, too. It had only been the year before that Pat Fane had taken notice of them for the first time, acknowledging them as men. Fane did not usually have time for anyone who was too young to buy a good deal of things off his wagon. Rand hoped he had not been relegated to a child again in the peddler's eyes. With a loud hurrah, Fane tugged at his heavy cloak. <laughs> No, not later, the peddler declaimed, once more throwing up a hand grandly. I will be telling you now. As he spoke, he made broad gestures, casting his words over the crowd. You are thinking you have had troubles in the two rivers, are you? Well, all the world has troubles. From the Great Blight South to the Sea of Storms, from the Earth Ocean to the West, to the ale waste in the east and even beyond the winter was harsher than you've ever seen before or oh, cold enough to gel your blood and crack your bones ah, winter was cold and harsh everywhere in the borderlands they'd be calling your winter spring but spring does not come you say wolves have killed your sheep Perhaps wolves have attacked men. Is that the way of it? Well, now, spring is late everywhere. There are wolves everywhere, all hungry for the f any flesh they can sink a tooth into, be it sheep or cow or man. But there are things worse than wolves or winter. There are those who would be glad to have only your little troubles. He paused expectantly. Nah. What could be worse than wolves killing sleeping men, Sin Buat demanded. Others muttered in support. Ah. Men killing men, okay. the peddlers replied nah. in portentous tones, nah. brought shocked murmurs nah. that increased as he went on. Nah. It is war, I mean. There is nah. war in Gael then. War and madness. The snows of the Dolan Forest are red with the blood of men. Ravens and the cries of ravens fill the air. Armies march to Gaalden. Nations, great houses and great men send their soldiers to fight. War? Master Alvira's mouth fit awkwardly around the unfamiliar word. No one in the two rivers had ever had anything to do with a war. Why are they having a war? Fane grinned. And Rand had the feeling he was mocking the villagers' isolation from the world and their ignorance. The peddler leaned forward as if he were about to impart a secret to the mayor. But his whisper was meant to carry and did. The standard of the dragon has been raised. And men flock to oppose. And to support. One long gasp left every throat together, and Rand shivered in spite of himself. Oh. The dragon, someone moaned. The dark one's loose in Gelden. Not the dark one, Harold Luhan growled. The dragon's not the dark one, and this is a false dragon anyway. Let's hear what Master Fate has to say, the mayor said. But no one would be quieted that easily. 
People cried out from every side, men and women shouting over one another. Just as bad as the Dark One. The dragon broke the world, didn't he? He started it. He caused a time of madness. You know the prophecies. When the dragon is reborn, your worst nightmares will seem like your fondest dreams. He's just another false dragon. He must be. What difference does that make? You remember the last false dragon. He started a war too. Thousands died. Isn't that right, Fane? He laid siege to Alien. It's evil times. No one claimed to be the dragon reborn for 20 years and now three in the last five years. Evil times. Look at the weather. Rand exchanged looks with Matt and Perrin. Matt's eyes shone with excitement, but Perrin wore a worried frown. Rand could remember every tale he had heard about the men who named themselves the Dragon Reborn, and if they had all proven fa themselves false dragons by dying or disappearing without fulfilling any of the prophecies, what they had done was bad enough. Whole nations torn by battle, and cities and towns put to the torch. Yeah, put to the torch. You don't like that? You don't like being put to the torch? I hope not. The dead fell like autumn leaves, and refugees clogged the roads like sheep in a pen. So the peddler said, and the merchants, and no one in the two rivers had with any sense doubted it. The world would end, so some said, when the real dragon was born again. Stop this, the mayor shouted. Be quiet! Stop working yourselves to a lather out of your own imaginations. Let Master Fane tell us about the false dragon. The people began to quiet him, but Sin Bu refused to be silent. Is this a false dragon? The Thatcher asked uh, sourly. Master Alvira blinked as if taken by surprise and snapped, Don't be an old fool, Sin. But Sin had rekindled the crowd again. He can't be the dragon reborn. Light help us, he can't. You old, you old Bill, you want the bad luck, don't you? Be naming the dark one next. You're taken by the dragon, Sin Bu, trying to bring us all harm. Sin looked around defiantly, trying to stare down the glowers and Raised his voice. I didn't hear Fane say this was a false dragon. Did you? Use your eyes. Where are the crops that should be knee higher, better? Why is it still winter when spring should be a month here a month? There were angry shouts for Sin to hold his tongue. I will not be silent. I have no liking for this talk either, but I won't hide my head under a basket till a Terran fairy man comes to cut my throat. And I won't dangle on Fane's pleasure. Not this time. Speak it out, plain peddler. What have you heard, eh? Is this the man of false dragon? If Vane was perturbed by the news he brought or the upset he had caused, he gave no sign of it. He merely shrugged and laid a skinny finger alongside his nose. As to that now, <laughs> who can say until it is over and done? He paused with one of his secretive grins, running his eyes over the crowd. as if imagining how they would react and finding it funny. I do know, he said too casually, that he can wield the one power. The others couldn't, but he can channel. The ground opens beneath his enemy's feet and strong walls crumble at his shout. Lightning comes when he calls and strikes where he points. That I've heard, and from me and I believe. A stunned silence fell. Rand looked at his friends. Parents seemed to be seeing things he did not like, but Matt yeah. still looked excited. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tam, his face only a little less composed than usual, drew the mare close. But before he could speak, you and Fingar burst out. He'll go mad and die. In the stories, men who channel the power always go mad, and then waste away and die. Only women can touch it. Doesn't he know that? <clears throat> he ducked under a cuff from Master Bue. Enough of that from you, boy. Sin shook a gnarled fish in Ewan's face. Show a proper respect and leave this to your elders. Get away with you. Hold steady, Sin, Tim growled. Boy's just curious. There's no need of this foolishness from you. Act your age, Brad added. And for once, remember you are a member of the council. Sin's wrinkled face grew darker with every word from Tam and the mare until he was almost purple. You know what kind of women he's talking about. Stop frowning at me, Luhan, and you too, Croft. This is a decent village of decent folk, 
And it's bad enough to have Fane here talking about false dragons using the power without the dragon possessed fool of a boy bringing Aes Sedai into it. Some things just shouldn't be talked about. And I don't care if you will be letting that fool gleam and tell any kind of tale he wants. It isn't right or decent. <coughs> Excuse me. I never saw or heard or smell anything that couldn't be talked about, Tam said. But Fane was not finished. They weren't. They weren't. This, the Aes Sedai are already into it, the peddler spoke up. A party of them has ridden south from Tarvalon. Since he can wield the power, none but Aes Sedai can defeat him. For all the battles they fight or deal with him once he's defeated, if he's defeated. Someone in the crowd moaned to loud, and even Tam and Bran exchanged uneasy frowns. Huddles of villagers clumped together, and some pulled their cloaks tighter around themselves, though the wind had actually lessened. Of course he'll be defeated, someone shouted. They're always beating in the end, false dragons. He has to be defeated, doesn't he? What if he isn't? Tam had finally managed to speak quietly into the mare's ear, and Bran, nodding from time to time and ignoring the hubbub around them, waited until he was finished before raising his own voice. All of you listen. Be quiet and listen. The shouting died to a murmur again. This goes beyond mere news from outside. It must be discussed by the village council, Master Fane. If you will join us inside the inn, we have questions to ask. A good mug of hot mulled wine would not go far amiss with me just now, the peddler replied with a chuckle. He jumped down from the wagon, dusted his hands on his coat, and cheerfully righted his cloak. Will you be looking after my horses, if you please? I want to hear what he has to say, more than one voice was raised in protest. You can't take him off. My wife sent me to buy pens. And that was Whit Conger. He hunched his shoulders at the stairs from the others gave him, but he held his ground. We were right to ask questions. Somebody back in the crowd shouted, Hey, be silent! The mayor roared, producing a startled hush. When the council has asked his questions, Master Vane will be back to tell you all the news and to sell you his pots and pens. Hugh, Tad! Stable Master Vane's horses. Tam and Bran moved on, in on either side of the pedal. The rest of the council gathered behind them and the whole cluster swept into the wine spring inn, firmly shutting the door in the faces of those who tried to crowd inside after them. Pounding on the door brought only a single shout from the mayor. What are you hitting me for? Hmm? Why are you beating daddy up? Go home! People milled around in front of the inn, muttering about what the peddler had said, and what it meant, and what questions the council was asking and why they should be allowed to listen and ask questions of their own. Some peered in through the front windows of the inn, and a few even questioned Hugh and Dad, though it was far from clear what they were supposed to know. The two stolid sablemen just grunted in reply and went on methodically removing the team's harness. One by one, they led Fane's horses away, and when the last was gone, did not return. Rand ignored the crowd. He took a seat on the edge of the old stone foundation, gathering his cloak around him and staring at the end door. Gealdon. Tarvalon. The very names were strange and exciting. They were places he knew only from peddler's news and tales told by merchants' guards. Aes Sedai and wars and false dragons. And those were the stuff of stories told late at night in front of the fireplace. Da, da, da. Hey. Hey. With one candle making strange shapes on the wall and the wind howling against the shutters. Are you reading too? Because you're not reading the same words I'm reading. They don't understand what you're saying. Do you mind if I read? Hmm? Do you mind? <laughs> Sorry. Give my wife a break today. Still, it must be different out there beyond the two rivers. Like living in the middle of a gleaming tale. An adventure. One long adventure, a whole lifetime of it. 
Slowly, the villagers dispersed, still muttering and shaking their heads. Wick Conger paused to share into the now abandoned wagon as though he might find another peddler hidden inside. Finally, only a few of the younger folk were left. Matt and Perrin drifted over to where Ran sat. I don't see how the gleaming could beat this, Matt said excitedly. I wonder if we might get to see this false dragon. Perrin shook his shaggy head. I don't want to see him. Somewhere else, maybe, but not in the two rivers. Not if it means war, Mariah. Not if it means war. Not if it means I should die either, Ran added. Or have you forgotten who caused the breaking? Yeah. The dragon may have started it, but it was Asadai who actually broke the world. <laughs> I heard a story once, Matt said slowly, from a war buyer's guard. He said the dragon would be reborn in mankind's greatest hour of need and save us all. Little girl, I'm trying to read a book. Can I read a story? Mm -hmm. What you do with your here? You wanna play with your, your mask? Put your mask on. We need to social distance up in here because you spitting on me. Yeah, I don't want your droplets. Keep your droplets off me. Dad. Yeah, I know I'm dead dead. I know I'm dead dead. Mm-hmm. All right, now, where was I? Ah. Well, he was a fool if he believed that, Perrin said firmly. And you were a fool to listen. He did not sound angry. He was slow to anger. But he sometimes got exasperated with Matt's quick silver fancies. And there was a touch of that in his voice. I suppose he claimed we'd all live in a new age of legends afterward, too. I didn't say I believed it, Matt protested. I just heard it. Nadine did too, and I thought she was going to skin me and the guard both. He said, the guard did, that a lot of people do believe, only they're afraid to say so, afraid of the Aes Sedai or the children of the light. He wouldn't say any more after Nadine lit into us. She told the merchant, and he said it was the guard's last trip with him. A good thing too, Karen said. The dragon going to save us? Sounds like Copland talked to me. Mariah, I'm trying to read. What kind of need would be great enough that we'd want the dragon to save us from it, Ram used, as well as for help from the Dark One? He didn't say, Matt replied uncomfortably, and he didn't mention any new age of legends. He said the world would be torn apart by the dragon's coming. That would surely save us, Perrin said dryly. Another breaking. Burn me, Matt growled. I'm only telling you what the guard said. Perrin shook his <coughs> head. Bless you. I just hope the Aes Sedai and this dragon, false or not, stay where they are. Maybe the way the two rivers will be spared. You think they're really dog friends? Matt asked, frowning thoughtfully. Who? Ran asked. I said I. Ran glanced at Perrin, who shrugged. The stories, he said slowly, but Matt cut him off. Not all the stories say they serve the dark one, Ran. Light, Matt, Ran said. They caused the breaking. What more do you want? I suppose, Matt sighed. But the next moment he was grinning again. Oh, Billy Conger says they don't exist. I said I, dark friends, says they're just stories. He says he doesn't believe the dark one either. Perrin snorted. Copman talked from a conger. What else can you expect? Oh, Billy named the dark one. I bet you didn't know that. Light, Ran breathed. Matt's grin broadened. It was last spring, just before the cutworm got into his fields and nobody else's. Right before everybody in his house came down with yellow eye fever. I heard him do it. He still says he doesn't bleed. But whenever I ask him to name the dark one now, he throws something at me. <laughs> mm. Excuse me. <laughs> I 
You are just stupid enough to do that, aren't you, Matron Carter? Not even a mirror stepped into their home. The dark braid pulled over her shoulder, almost bristling with anger. Rand scrambled to his feet, slender and barely taller than Matt's shoulder. At the moment, the wisdom seemed taller than any of them, and it did not matter that she was young and pretty. I suspected something of the sort about Billy Conger at the time, but I thought you at least had more sense than to try taunting him in a such a thing. You may be old enough to be married, Matron Cawthon, but in truth, you shouldn't be off your mother's apron springs. The next thing, you'll be naming the dark one yourself. No, Wisdom, Matt protested, looking as if he would rather be anywhere else than there. It was old bi I, I mean, Master Conger, not me. Blood and ashes, I... Watch your tongue, Matrim. Rand stood up straighter. Hey, 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 hey. Hey, hey. Rand stood up straighter, though her glare was not directed at him. Perrin looked equally abashed. Later, one or another of them would almost certainly complain about being scolded by a woman not all that much older than themselves. Someone always did after one of Nynaeve's scoldings, if never in her hearing. Yes? You reading? Okay, what word you on? But in the gap in ages, always seemed more than wide enough when face to face with her, especially if she was angry. The stick in her hand was thick at one end and a slender switch at the other. She was liable to give a flail to anybody she thought was acting a fool, heads or hands or legs, no matter their age or position. The wisdom so held his attention that at first, Rand failed to see she was not alone. When he realized his mistake, he began to think about leaving no matter what Nani would say or do later. Egwene stood a few paces behind the wisdom, watching intently of a height with Nynaeve and with the same dark coloring, she could at that moment have been a reflection of Nynaeve's mood. Arms crossed beneath her breast, mouth tight with disapproval, the hood of her soft gray cloak shaded her face, and her big brown eyes held no laughter now. You trying to get my book? Pad cake, pad a cake, baker's make. Bake me a cake as fast as you can. Roll them up, roll them up. Put them in my pants. Put them in my pants. All right. If there was any fairness, he thought, that being two years older than her, should give him some advances. But that was not the way of it. At the best of time, he was never very nimble with his tongue when talking to any of the village girls. Not like Karen, but whenever a green gave him that intent look, with her eyes as wide as they would go, as if every last ounce of her attention was on him, he just could not seem to make the words go where he wanted. Perhaps he could get away as soon as not even finished, but he knew he would not. Even if he did understand why. I'm sorry, either he did not understand why. If you are done staring like a moonstruck lamb, ran out Thor, and not even said, perhaps you can tell me why you were talking about something even you three great bull calves ought to have sense enough to keep out of your mouths. Rand gave a start and pulled his eyes away from her green. She had grown a disconcerting smile while the wisdom began speaking. Nani's voice was tart, but she had the beginnings of a knowing smile on her face, too, until Matt laughed aloud. <laughs> the wisdom's smile vanished, and the look she gave Matt cut his laughter off in a strangled croak. Well, Rand... Nynaeve said. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Egwene still smiling. What does she think is so funny? It was the natural enough talk of it, wisdom. He said hurriedly. The peddler, Pat and Fane, uh, Master Fane, brought news of a false dragon in Gaalden and a war in I Sedai. The council thought it was important enough to talk to him. What else would we be talking about? Yeah, yeah. What else would they be talking about? Hmm? Nani shook her head. So that's why the peddler's wagon stands abandoned. I heard people rushing to meet it, but I couldn't leave Mistress A. Yell until her fever broke. The council is questioning the peddler about what's happening in Gialden, are they? If I know them, they're asking all the wrong questions and none of the right ones. It will take the women's circle to find out anything useful. 
Selling her cloak firmly on her shoulder, she disappeared into the end. Egwene did not follow the wisdom. She followed all the noise that the little baby was making. While well, daily trying to read. <laughs> hey. Say hey, Dada. Say hey, YouTube. Say love you. Say appreciate you watching my daddy. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. Dada. 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 Mm -hmm. Dada. Dada. <coughs> As the end door closed behind Nynaeve, the younger woman came to stand in front of Bran. The frowns were gone from her face, but her unbleeding stare made him uneasy. He looked to his friends, but they moved away, grinning broadly as they abandoned him. Mm -hmm. No, no. You shouldn't let Matt get you mixed up in his foolishness, Bran. Egwene said, as solemn as a wisdom herself. Then abruptly she giggled. <laughs> I haven't seen you look like that since Sam Bue caught you and Matt up in the apple trees when you were ten. <clears throat> he shifted his feet and glanced at his friends. They stood not far away, Matt gesturing excitedly as he talked. Will you dance with me tomorrow? And that was not what he had meant to say. He did not want to dance with her, but at the same time, he wanted nothing so little as the uncomfortable way she, he was sure to feel while he was with her. The way he felt right then, <clears throat> the corners of her mouth quirked up in a little smile. In the afternoon, she said, I will be busy in the morning. From the others came Perrin's exclamation, A gleeman! And Green turned toward them, but Ran put a hand on her. Uh, busy? How? Despite the chill, she pushed back the hood of her cloak, and with apparent casualness, pulled her hair forward over her shoulder. The last time he had seen her, her hair had hung in dark waves below her shoulders, with only a red ribbon keeping it back from her face. Now, it was worked into a long braid. He stared at that braid as if it were a viper, then stole a glance at the spring pole, standing alone on the green now, ready for tomorrow. In the morning, unmarried women of marriageable age would dance the pole. He swallowed hard. Somehow, it had never occurred to him that she would reach marriageable age at the same time that he did. Mm -hmm. You're not getting married till you're 72. Yes, you're not having no boyfriends either. Nope. No boyfriends. No little boys that come sniffing around. Hair braided or not braided. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. <laughs> Yeah, but no. Mm -mm. Don't give me that look. Hey, stop, stop. Just because someone is old enough to marry you, mother, doesn't mean they should. Not right away. Of course not. Or ever, for that matter. Rand blinked. Ever? A wisdom almost never marries. Nynaeve has been teaching me, you know. She says, I have a talent that I can learn to listen to the wind. Nani says, not all wisdoms can, even if they say they do. Wisdom? <laughs> he hooted. He failed to notice the dangerous glint in her eye. Nani will be wisdom here for another 50 years at least. Probably more. Are you going to spend the rest of your life as her apprentice? There are other villages, she replied heatedly. Nani says that the villages north of Terran always choose a wisdom from away. They think it stops her from having favorites among the village folk. His amusement belted as fast as it has come. Outside the two rivers, I'd never see you again. No one ever leaves the two rivers, he went on. Maybe somebody from Terran Fury, but they're all strange anyway. Hardly like two rivers folk at all. A green gave an exasperated sigh. Well, Maybe I'm strange, too. Maybe I want to see some of the places I hear about in the stories. Have you ever thought of that, Mariah? Have you ever thought of that? <laughs> of course I have. I daydream sometimes. But I know the difference between daydreams and what's real. And I do not, she said furiously. 
and promptly turned her back on him. That wasn't what I meant. I was talking about me, the queen. She jerked her cloak around her. A wall to shed him off and stiffly walked a few paces away. He rubbed his head in confusion. <sighs> now to explain. This was not the first time he, she had squeezed meanings from him, words that he never knew were in them. In her present mood, a misstep would only make matters worse, and he was fairly sure that nearly anything he said would be a misstep. Man and Perrin came back then, the green ignoring their coming, and they looked at her hesitantly, then crowded close to Ram. Moraine gave Perrin a coin too, Matt said, just like ours. He paused before adding, Hey, and he saw the rider. Where? Man and Man, when? Did anybody else see him? Did you tell anyone? Perrin raised broad hands in a just swollen gesture. One question at a time. I saw him on the edge of the village, watching the smithy, just at twilight yesterday. He gave me the shivers he did. I told Master Luhan, only nobody was there when he looked. He said I was seeing shadows, but he carried his biggest hammer around with him while we were banking the forge fire and putting the tools up. He's never done that before. So he believed you, Rand said. The parents shrugged. I don't know. I asked him how he was carrying the hammer if all I saw was shadows. And he said something about wolves getting bold enough to come into the village. Maybe he thought that's why I saw him. But he ought to know I can tell the difference between a wolf and a man on horseback. Even at dusk. I know what I saw. And nobody's going to make me believe different. I believe you, Rand said. Remember, I saw him too. Perrin gave a satisfied grunt as if not, not been sure of that. What are you talking about? Egwene demanded suddenly. Rand suddenly wished he had spoken more quietly. He would have, if he had realized she was listening, Matt and Perrin grinning like fools fell all over themselves, telling her of their encounters with the black cloak rider. But Rand kept silent. He was sure he knew what she would say when they were done. Nynaeve was right, Egwene announced to the sky when the two youths fell silent. Yay. None of you is ready yeah. to be off leading strings. People do ride horses, you know. That doesn't make them monsters out of a gleaming tail. Yeah. Rand nodded to himself. It was just as he had thought. She rounded on him. And you've been spreading these tales. Sometimes you have no sense, Rand Althor. The one has been frightening enough without you going about scaring the children. Uh, Rand gave a sour grimace. Okay. I haven't spread anything, Egwene. But I saw what I saw, and it was no farmer out looking for a stray cow. Egwene drew a deep breath and opened her mouth. But whatever she had been going to say vanished as the door of the inn opened and a man with shaggy white hair came hurrying out of as it pursued. And that, thank you for listening, is the noisy end to chapter three of The Will of Time, book one, The Eye of the World. The Peddler. And I am going to go and try to get this one a nap so that I can also read chapter four. The Gleeman. So we'll see you on the next one. Thanks for watching. Please like. Please share. It's greatly appreciated. You have no idea how much it helps the channel. And if you don't mind, please subscribe with the notification bell on so that you'll know whenever I upload a new video and you'll be able to read along with us. I'm going to try to read the next chapter without her. And if it bothered you, if she was a distraction, then I'm very sorry. Perhaps I'll read this chapter again without my baby. <laughs> Thank you so much. We'll see you later.